Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Grayscale Gorilla podcast. Uh, as always, we have Chad Ashley here. How you doing, Chad? Doing good. How about you? Dude, you're looking good. Nice shirt today. Yeah, just for you. Little and Chris Schmidt, Chris Schmidt uh, in, uh, on, the, on, the, on the south side of Chicago. Do you call it the south side? What, no, I'm, I'm near West Loop. West Loop. West Loop. All right. Uh, how you been? How you been? What, what's good. up? Good, good. Happy Tuesday, guys. Happy Tuesday. Um, good to see you as always. Uh, I real quick over here. I've been, uh, I've been playing around in cinema today, um, and I just wanted to tell everybody how much I love the physical render. I forget, <laughs> I forget how good it looks. I set up really simple lights. Uh, you know, I used HDRI Studio Rig. I put some textures on this thing, lit it up, and it looked instantly. I put a little top coat. I'm saying I use this stuff, put a little top coat on it, hit render. And I was like, this is looking good. All right, time to go crank up the samples, get our final render out. Two hours later, two hours later, I got my final render. And I forget how dang pretty it is, but also how dang slow it is. Um, yeah, that's but, why I snickered there in case anybody thought I was just being a jerk. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, Before the podcast, he told me how long the render took. And I was like, oh, my God. So it wasn't me really just being, uh, uh, you know, the render snob, but no, it, you know, I, I there's so many people that use it still, including me. I mean, I I think it's easy to relatively easy to use as long as long as I stay out of the reflectance mess and use a, t a top coat. Um, it's pretty easy. It's it's good looking. It it makes sense. Um, but man, I think I think depth of field is where I went wrong. I think I, I think I should just get a better outside of cinema depth of field workflow, like get my frish lift out. But is there a frish lift for Photoshop? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, I got to get a workflow going. Sorry, I you know I totally took over just right in the front there. I just had some Cinema Forty questions for you guys. Well, I I think I still think physical is great. I wish they were. I wish they would keep moving with it like i would be curious to see where it would go but i don't i don't think it is which is too bad because it is good and that's something that like i talk to a lot of people or i'll and i'll or i'll post something on instagram and the immediate response like it's a render that i'll post and the immediate response is oh i better use this or i better use that or i better use you know whatever renderer octane arnold redshift whatever and a lot of times it's something that could have been done in physical. It just doesn't like it's not necessarily always the renderer that that makes it look awesome. It's your choice in lighting, your choice in textures and so I think you yeah. I think you can get good results out of standard if you really knew what you were doing. Well, it reminds me of uh, camera world where everybody wants to know what camera you used after you've spent, you, you know, your like half your career trying to like perfect where and how to light and take a photo and lay on the ground and set up things just right. And then you get it all done. They're like, oh, yeah, what camera did you use? Yeah, that, it, yeah, that's exactly kind of the vibe. And it's uh, it's an interesting I think I think, uh, man, I, I'm definitely there. I'm I, I'm there right now with music. So uh I'm getting back into music, playing a lot more music, and getting into uh, anyway. I'll, I, that's a separate podcast, but I am in gear mode. I find myself that when I'm newly interested in something, that I I kind of fall in that same trap, which is okay. What gear do I need? Well, I can't really get started until I get you know the full version of Ableton, right? I can't you know. But no, that's not right. Like GarageBand is on my phone. It's on my computer. I could like go downstairs and like just literally play drums or p piano or whatever. Like. I don't have to wait for the gear to show up to get better at my craft. And I always forget that. And I think it's why I end up talking about why, you know, the hard stuff is so important all the time when I, when I do talks and stuff, it's because it's all, it's often the boring part for me, at least it's like to really sit down and do the hard stuff is, is hard. It's a reason it's called the hard stuff. So, uh, I guess, I, I guess I'm trying to draw an early analogy. I'm getting weird on my analogy early this podcast. I'm going crazy. Got that right out of the way. It's going to be a weird one today, but I think that's true when it comes to renders and Cinema 4D and, and, and things you do on a computer. I think it's true with cameras. I think it's true with music stuff, obviously. Um, man, I think it's true with you know so many things that you want to start to do and get better at, 
and you ask somebody that's been doing it a long time and they'll say the thing that you never want to hear, which is like, you got to work at this for a long time. <laughs> and you're like, no, what's Wait, the what? secret? Wait, just tell renderers. me what, yeah, like just, tell me what, just tell me what render to buy. Yeah. Tell me what fuzz box I need to plug in to sound like Jimi Hendrix. They're like, well, I got bad news for you. you it, to, it, it takes a lot of like sitting cross-legged on your bed and practicing your scales. And you're like, oh, that's not what I wanted to hear. Yeah. I mean, I think music is probably, yeah, music and photography, music even more so though, because I, I you can't walk into a music, like a guitar center or a music store and not immediately start looking around and seeing every person there who is more involved in like the decision on what wah pedal to buy than writing a song or playing a song. And it just like it, I see the same kind of thing happening. What well, happens everywhere, I guess. Like you start to, the easy entry point is to understand the equipment needed. The hard, like you said, the hard stuff to understand is just you don't. Your mind just doesn't want to go there yet. Like I don't want to know how to write a song. I just want to know how to make my guitar sound like this. And it's the that's the hard stuff. Yeah, it's 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 not really. It's, it's easy. interesting because. I have this debate all the time. I was just talking to um, a friend of mine yesterday about this. This idea that some things pull you in to a new hobby. Like you, 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 you're you, interested in something new. Let's say it's mountain biking. And you're like, I want a mountain bike. That sounds fun. And your brain goes to like, what? How many thousands of dollars do I need to spend to go like, to, to go like start to do this? And and in, And in some ways, it's a distraction of like, do you even want to do this? Like go rent a mountain bike for 20 bucks at the local, you know, bike shop and go like, you know, go find a place. Um, and, and then you realize you hate it and you fall and you hurt yourself. Yeah. And then you realize like, Ooh, I hate bugs, you know? And you're like, Oh man, uh, I forgot there was like nature involved with mountain biking. <laughs> and so, and, and I bring that up because I, I constantly tell myself that like right now with the music stuff, um, you know, it's always like, you know, the 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 best dressed person at the gym is often like the one that's the newest, uh, and and like more obsessed about the yoga clothes than actually just going once a day or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I, it, and so all of this is to say not that there's a right or wrong way. I think that there are certain things that pull you into it, like you said, the tech or the the finding out what camera to buy or doing research and all that stuff is super fun. But I always find it interesting that those things are never on, almost never on anyone's list when you ask somebody that's been doing it a long time and you say, what's the secret? Almost none of them say you got to have the exact right camera. <laughs> you know, you, like, listen, if you're not wearing the exact perfect Lululemon shirt, then you're just not going to be able to pull this uh, weightlifting thing off. <laughs> what? That's funny. Yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Like, do, do you guys have, how do you guys see like new hobbies and hooks and maybe, you know, music and Chris, I know like board games and all these things that we're all into. Do you guys find that, you know, there's an element of where you do more research than you do um, like the act of doing the hobby? Do you have no. anything like that? No, that, that happens all the time. I can't think of the number of hobbies I've started and they don't, they don't hook me in enough to get into the hard part of it. I can't think of the number. I can't even remember the number of times over the years that I've been like, I should download GarageBand and just tinker around. And I open it up and I start tinkering. I watch a tutorial or two. It's like, okay, cool. And then a week's gone by and I haven't touched it again. So that happens over and over again on things. So it just turns into which, which things hook you. And I guess it's important not to spend too much money on that if you're not going to get past a week. <laughs> I know I find myself doing that sometimes. It's um, hard, man. I don't, I don't, I don't do hobbies. I guess I'm not really. I don't really have hobbies. Come on, I don't. I'm, I'm trying to think of anything, dude, and I'm like struggling here. Like, I mean, I've, I've got two kids. You're, you're busy, um, dad. You're working. You know, I'm, 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 uh, you know, dripping every ounce of, uh, you know, talent I can out of you over here. You know, <laughs> telling you to work eighty hours a week. <sighs> But you know, I'm just really burnt out. My boss is like always <laughs> on my ass. Like, well, think about like you were a musician. You were you were into music. You're into skateboarding. Yeah, yeah like, like I I got that stuff out of my out of my system pretty early on. I think now, 
I bike a little bit. I fish a little bit, hang out with the kids, just do stuff around here. We, we try to go do stuff as a family pretty often. Like my wife's pretty good about planning excursions. Uh, so we do that sort of thing, but yeah, I, I just, I've always loved, um, Honestly, it's it sounds really nerdy, but I I really like 3D, and I kind of do it even when I'm not technically on the clock doing it. I'm doing it, so I'm always reading about it, learning about it. It's just that is my passion, I guess. You live in the dream, Chad. Yeah, yeah. doing you know doing what you mostly love to do, and yeah, getting Can't paid complain. to to you know do more of it. Um, Chris, what's uh, I don't know why this is, is so interesting to me. I think it is because it's popped up in conversation in different spheres of conversation, not just with Cinema 4D or not just with photography, but with so many people out there, just curious people trying to learn things, trying to do more stuff. You run into this idea of like, all right, when is it time to stop shopping and when is it time to start doing? And that that line, I just find myself running into all the time. Chris, what do you do? You have any? Uh, tips or ways to think about that kind of kind of stuff i i don't know that i have great advice on that because i jump all over the place well there, but you do a lot of stuff i would think that you might have like you, you know i always like when you come back from a weekend like what'd you do all weekend like well i learned unity and then i programmed my own video game you know like what and so like that's something for example that you could dive into and say okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna learn unity this weekend and so maybe here's a question like at what point do you stop watching other people do unity and when do you start like trying to break it yourself mm, I, I wish i had really good fast and and clear answers on this but even something like unity well first of all you don't learn unity in a week you learn it that's almost like a cinema 40 there's always going to be more and more and more and more but you can make something fun in a week Definitely. But then it does turn into you jump in and I mean, I've, I think I've mentioned before, like my general process when it comes to something like software is generally jump in, open the program, just start pushing buttons, open files, you know, in Unity or Cinema or any 3D. It's like, okay, let's make, can I make a sphere? Can I do that? Okay. Can I make it move from left to right? Okay, cool. Can I do this? Okay. Where do I put code? After you've familiarized yourself, you've poked all the buttons, you've done all that. It's like, okay, cool. Close it. Open up a fresh file. Let's watch a video. Let's open up the manual. Let's see what they're talking about for real. I've got context for this. And that just turns into like, I watch something. It seems kind of cool. And I start burrowing down. Like, let's go down that rabbit hole. I go as far as I can take that. And then it's like, okay, now I have to go do some more research because I hit a, a wall on that. Let me go tinker with something else. And I, a lot of it, you know, especially in something like Unity, you can watch a tutorial. There's tons of tutorials out there for, like, you can have the bare bones of a of coding yourself using only the in-game, in the in-engine tools and have a basic first-person shooter going in like two hours so you you get such a really good reward mix on that type of thing but yeah i think that uh, but i mean that it changes everything when i was doing trying to do some wiring up on quadcopters i was doing tons of research before doing anything because like, okay I, I need to buy a soldering iron i don't know how to solder i let me look up how to solder okay now i've done that what am i soldering to what because i'm not going to make guesses here because if i guess it i'm going to burn out components or start a small fire in my bedroom again <laughs> again i love that <laughs> start, start a small fire in my bedroom again wait for it again uh yeah yeah go go back and listen about the uh the 3d uh quadcopter a uh, 3d printed quadcopter episode yeah that's fun Can't dude i spent so much time that you know what the thing i learned the most about while working on the quadcopter was actually 3d printing because i was designing the body for it which was probably a silly exercise in a lot of ways, but I, it, except for how much I learned. And then I was, do you guys remember, or I'm sure it's still a thing when you go to the store and you can buy models like an airplane, like a world war two tank and some model. Do you remember there was a, a series of models called snap tight, which meant you didn't need glue. The model pieces would snap into each other. Awesome. And so when I was working on the quadcopter, I wanted, cause 3d printing takes a long time. It takes a lot of material and the material is not cheap. So, so. Oh, you muted there. You muted. Yep. Oh yeah. Are you back? This is the. Uh, I have the part of the episode where I do a weird analogy, yeah. and then Chris always has a part of the episode where his mic goes crazy. <laughs> and then I'm it, back. And then it comes back. So we're all good. 
Go ahead. I, I actually bumped the wire that time, so it was my fault. The uh, I guess it's always my fault on that. But anyway, uh, 3D printing. I didn't want to spend a lot of time doing all these like big infills and whatnot, so I started printing these very flat truss-like structures, like just one face of a truss. And I kept I iterated over and over and over again to the point where I could make these triangle trusses and just snap them into each other with no screws or no glue. And I could just print completely flat on the bed, peel them off the bed. They were like flexible in one direction. I could make these really cool trusses. And I, I was learning so much about like tolerances and printing screw holes already pre-made into it and getting all the scaling done and like super efficient use of material. So all of that was was super fun. But it really is it really at a certain point it does turn into you don't. I can't sit around worrying about the 3D printer. I need to start getting my hands dirty and printing something and learning about the material and learning about about, about the strength and it's sticking to the platform. How do I make it not stick to the platform? You got to you got to get dirty with whatever the topic is. And 3D yeah. printing definitely was like the hot thing for a while. It was when I built that quad capture. I don't remember how long it was ago. Like three three years ago when At I was least. super into that. And I remember going up to one of our our buddies in Chicago and I said, "Oh, I've been." I was 3D printing the body for my quadcopter. And he said, that is the most 2015 sentence I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. I remember like when it was like blowing up uh, the studio I was at, the, um, the uh, managing director was obsessed with getting a 3D printer for the office. And, and I was just like, why? It's a 3D printer. What? Well, I thought you'd want this, and I'm like, I don't, well, I don't want to maintain that and clean the nozzles and like make sure it's working. Like, it's I've got the word 3D in it, Chad. I know, it's like that out. always bugged me, man. Like, and I was like, well, we can just send it to Shapeways, or there's a place <laughs> down the street, or whatever. And it just was like, why do you want this? Like, and then it started showing up. Like, we start hearing about schools trying to get them and stuff. Like, oh, the school wants to get a 3D printer, and. I was always like, well, why are they going to learn how to model? Like, what is the point of that? It's not like you can just order up a 3D model of a, I don't know, an iPhone and print it out, and there you, there's your iPhone. Well, I don't know. I would, I would argue that the school has good reason to have access to something like that. Like, if you're in a CAD class, like having yeah, a uh, 3D yeah, printer, sure. like that level. I'm talking like elementary schools, mm, like not yeah, maybe not, still. I guess it depends. It, it was what, like, like this get this gets back to hooks, right? Like that a three D printer is one of those perfect hooks that yes, yes. that has no sometimes no like actual value. It, like maybe a you could you like print the coat hook or whatever. You know, I'm I'm thinking of like a younger kid. Um but that could be the hook, just like a quadcopter, just like any of these things, yeah, could be the hook to bring uh people into learning something more with more uh, immediate value. Well, that to that the world. that 3D printer that like a a a kid in kindergarten, like an engineer, is now born because they got to play with a 3D printer. In the same way that the school, I mean, I don't know if you guys had this, but I think most people, you have your music class in like third or fourth grade where everybody has to buy a recorder, and you kind of like have that's, a flute. That's still a thing, by yeah. the way. <laughs> but no, that's what I mean, though. Like you buy, everybody buy has to one. buy this. You know, like your parents have to pay forty dollars to buy this plastic flute. But everybody gets their first taste of playing music. And everybody, and most people might not pursue it, but a bunch of people might. And it might introduce you to a new skill you wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. So I think something like a 3D printer and then having just a small part of a class. I mean, being computer literate is just an absolute must now. This isn't a question. And a 3D printing at this point is... I don't know. I think it. I think that's a pretty important thing to be exposed to. I think. I think a decent portion of a class would be pretty interested in what they could make. And just think of just think of the the exercise and geometry and and turning something physical and being able to rotate it. Like those are important like mental models to be able to build. Right. And the, the I don't fact disagree. That, I think that the problem that I was having with it is that it was expensive and the school didn't even have air conditioning. So okay. it was like okay, I'll give you that one. <laughs> so there, there's like I don't disagree with you. I mean, of course, I actually our high school here gives all the students Chromebooks when you when you get to school. Like when you get to this high school, you get a Chromebook and um, that's crazy to me. Like basically everybody gets a laptop. And like, you're right. And the recorder thing, totally agree. That's what got my, one of my daughters into playing flute is because she played that and she was like, wow, I can actually do this. And that's fantastic. And I, I so I don't want it to sound like I'm anti introducing people to stuff. 
I just feel like, you know, obviously there's more, I guess, easier or cheaper ways for schools to do it. Cause well, that was he, like, here's one, here's a weird one for me. Um, that could have, th th that I think, that I think made a huge difference for me learning computer skills and being interested in what I'm interested in doing, which was video games. I grew up with around a computer and I was just always obsessed with games, wanted a Nintendo, had an Atari growing up. And when I looked at a computer, I was like, how do I put play more games on this thing? And so I learned like how DOS worked and how to install and, and delete things and how to move things and how to compress things and how to like troubleshoot a computer purely to make sure that, you know, like theme park worked and like King's quest worked. And that, that for me was that first bite of learning this stuff and the idea that this little box could do anything. Right. And then uh, like windows, whatever it was, 3.1 came out, it wasn't DOS anymore. And I could record, you know, with a little music recorder and record my voice and reverse it and start to play with music that way. Like that, that was the hook for me. And I, and I guess, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of riffing here. I, I don't, I, I don't know if this is like a big full topic to discuss, but I, what I always find interesting is how people learn things especially how people learn things early on in their learning stage. And for me, there's always that thing that you learn, no matter what it is, let's just take Cinema 4D or 3D or whatever. There's always that thing that you figure out a, a six months later, a year later, that you wish you knew a year ago. And it kind of gets back to last week's topic. If you didn't listen to that one, that's all about what you would tell yourself uh, when you're in college to help yourself later in your career. And there's an element of that but in, it's really about how it how a mental model starts to form around something new that you're learning. Because anytime, anytime you're learning something new, it's by definition something you haven't learned. And the way that humans learn is by connecting the dots to things that they know in the past. That's just how we work. When you tell, I can't tell you what yellow is until I show you something that you already know that's yellow, right? And if I say, hey, have you ever seen a school bus? okay, that's the color I'm talking about. You're like, oh, cool, yellow, got it. And now you know it because you've seen that color before, you're make, making that connection. So that's how that's how humans learn, is by connecting it with things they've already known. So there's always that part for me when I'm learning something new that I, that I start to make this analogy and my brain goes, oh, uh, I see in After Effects, there's this and this and this. That's kind of like in Pro Tools, which I used before that, where you can make a clip and group things together. That's kind of like a pre-comp. Oh, okay, I get it. And the the problem is, is I wish I could have known that from the start. So I'm always looking for that shortcut of like how to make an analogy to something I already know. And so when you when you learn something, this is why I bring this stuff up. When you learn something new, or when I learn something new, my goal is to like figure out as much of it as I can in the shortest amount of time because time's the thing I can't control, right? Like I, I have limited time in the world and I want to learn faster. And something I like about both of you guys too is, uh, is how quickly you learn stuff. So I, I guess maybe a question is like, do you have a mental model of when you sit down and learn something new on how you approach learning it? Do you, do you catch yourself going off on tangents? Do you catch yourself like reading the manual? Is that something you always do? Is that something, whatever? Do you look for people on YouTube that you trust with high rating? Like what's your angle on going out and learning something new to you? You want to go chat? Oh man, that's a, what's the goal? Is that what the question was? Is, like how do you, you, how do you, if go you needed to go learn, let's say, let's, let's keep it. 3D for now, but understand that this is kind of just a hopefully a general idea. If you were if you had to go learn real flow or something, or Houdini might be a, a good example today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would you go about doing it? Would you go call your friend? Uh, would you yeah, go for sure. search on YouTube? Like what what would how would you go approach that right now? I think I would probably contact everybody that I know that uses it every day and say, what do you, what's a good place to start? And what are some people putting out training that I should go check out? And I would amass, I would just start writing down all this stuff. And then I would go, usually I'll go into YouTube and I'll build a playlist and I'll start adding things to the playlist and adding things to the playlist. 
and maybe I haven't even opened it up yet. I haven't even downloaded it yet, but between, um, you know, while I'm doing stuff around the house or whatever, I'll be watching all those videos. I might not have, I might not have even opened the application yet, but I will have watched at least 20 videos of people using it. So I start to understand the language. I start to see where they're clicking and what they're doing and what, what um, it's like a language to me. So it's like, what's the equivalent of, um, you know, a poly selection or, you know, is it a cluster? Like what, what, what do they call these things? And I start to just watch as much as I can absorb, absorb, absorb. Then I download it. And then as soon as I download it, I probably find maybe one video that kind of is an intro E kind of like, here's where you click for this really, really drag and drop kind of tutorial just to get my bearings. And then I just, then it's just putting in the time, putting in the hours and, and stepping it up every, every time. I don't, I never dive into an application or learning something into the deep end. I never start by saying, I'm going to make this amazingly cool thing and I'm going to use Houdini to do it. I would start with something as basic as let me make a cube. Okay. I checked that off my list. Now I'm going to make a sphere. Okay, cool. Check that off my list. And just like start with like start that engine with just like the slowest movement and then sort of build to it. Because if I just if I try to if I try to learn something by diving into the deep end with no context and and no work, then I get frustrated and I don't want to learn it. Does that make sense? Like you you almost yeah, like because you you basically you you burn you, you, do, you and you're doing yourself a disservice and the and whatever you're learning a disservice. I would never pick up a guitar and expect to play, um, you know, a Van Halen solo. You know, like that is just insane. Like that that just not it's not going to happen. I would pick up a guitar and learn how to play some chords and maybe learn some scales. And then if I spent a really long time at it, I might be able to play a song. Uh, but I tr I kind of in the same way with 3D. You know, like I don't. I'm not, people ask me like, are you going to learn Houdini? Are you going to do Houdini, Houdini, Houdini? And I want to learn Houdini. I really do. But I feel like it's going to be such a time suck for me to get, to learn it, to become fluent in it. And that's, that's how I, I, I'd like to use language metaphors when it comes to learning software, because I think it's really like learning a language. And I, and I know that for me to become fluent in Houdini, it's going to take me two years. And I've got to be ready for that commitment. And right now I'm just not, not ready yet. It's one of those complicated languages, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I would, I would completely agree. Well, as far as the, the commitment level on that, Chad, where, well, even that, like I could get in and be dangerous in any piece of software very quickly, but I think a lot of people are probably asking you if you're going to get into Houdini so that you can start making tutorials for them to help <laughs> to learn Houdini. And for me to be at a level where I'd be confident teaching other people, that's a huge commitment. Like I, I want to know something inside and out. Hearing your method is interesting though, since it is, it's, there, there's a lot of similarities, but you have a very different order for them. For me, the first thing would be download the software, like download the demo, get the software, just start tinkering, start playing, make a sphere, see if I can figure out what the equivalent of making it editable is. Let's start moving points around. Okay, cool. I move points around. Can I figure out some sort of extrude or cut or let's get the tool going? Like, okay. And I'll just like grab a thing and travel down a path. I don't have a specific plan beyond like, you know, like, okay, a five minute process of like, okay, let's see if I can get a little bit of modeling going. Okay, cool. Where's lighting? Uh, there's a light. Okay. Let's see if I get a little bit of lighting going. Just travel down some different paths. Okay, cool. Go over here. Let's do a little bit of that. Let's see. Oh, here's some sort of dynamics. Oh, look, I've, I've stumbled into the scripting, the node-based scripting language inside here. Can I figure anything out there? Just travel down different paths. And it'll be, it's even constantly going to be like dead end. Uh, can I do this? Dead end. Nope, can't do this. Dead end. And just keep going a little further down the road, like kind of feeling out where the walls are and everything. And then like what's funny is, and it's probably going to be in contrast to Chad and super contrast to Nick, is I don't feel like I would approach any person. I, at this point, I don't feel that I've put in the time or effort to go and bug someone else to get their opinion on things. Even if it's like, hey, what's your favorite YouTuber on this? I, I have a particular style of person I like to listen to and learn from. So after I've gone and I've pushed all the buttons and poked around, my next step would probably be YouTube. Go to YouTube, just pretty much search for the, the word Houdini, 
like Houdini tutorials and start like, oh, I would open up 20 tabs of like, okay, let's see this guy. Let's try this person. Look at uh, like this woman has a video. Let's try this one, this one, this one. Open up a bunch of videos, go to the first video, start listening. Like, can I, you know, it, maybe you, you have trouble understanding their accent. Maybe they speak really slowly. Maybe they're so monotone, you're not going to be able to keep going. So it's going to be like, like, if you, if you hit the number of keys on your keyboard, if you hit one or two or three, you'll jump to 20% into the video, 30% of the video. So it's like, okay, are they talking? Are they talking? Are they talking? Did they accomplish anything? And I'll just go through those 20 videos and see if any of them has a style that I can listen to a little bit or if they're giving information at a good clip. I will find a couple of those videos and be like, okay, it's worth watching these. And then I will go through and start watching. And even while watching it, it's going to be on some sort of fast forward and anytime it's it's a little slower than i want it's just like skip forward skip forward i just want like these meaty you, little bits i think you just have you have a unique brain though chris like because your brain operates at a different rpm than most people uh so yeah i i, I could see i i've seen that in action and I'm, my brain just does not I, I can't churn through that stuff that quickly. That's why when I was learning Cinema 4D, I was watching you and I was watching Nick and I was watching other people because I like to absorb their decision making and why they reached for that thing or this thing or why they decided to approach the modeling challenge this way because it helps me understand the landscape of the program. So it was really important for me when I was learning Cinema 4D to watch as much content as I possibly could and some of it was bad some of it was probably not like tutorials that you guys would consider to be good but I knew I knew they probably weren't very good but I could still watch them and and start to understand the different levels of which people operate in in the program and when I watch uh, one thing I will say about Chris's videos you don't ever watch them on anything other than 1x because <laughs> you will not understand a word that this guy is saying um because the other like me you can watch me you can watch me on 1.5 and probably be pretty good too if you're like can really pick things up quickly but chris now you're at 0.5 you're at one <laughs> you're slowing if, them down if you're lucky um but yeah i could see that i also i think chris that has to, your style has to do with the fact that you only have been using cinema for so long that um, it 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 really is kind of like you mentioned, like not wanting to bug someone or talk to somebody about reaching out and and picking their brain on on a specific YouTuber or whatnot. I think if you um, if you knew maybe like three or four different three D apps and you had friends that that were you know always talking to you about those things, I think that would probably not be as much of an issue. You'd probably be more open to that. Or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it's just not your style. No, I, I I see I see both sides. I've I've done both sides. Um, where you want to kind of discover it on your own, and I think um, in in many ways it's kind of like me, it's kind of like listening to music. Um, where your friend tells you that this band is really good, and you're you're like more skeptical at that point than if you discovered it on your own, um, and you just stumbled into their music. It feels like you own it a little bit more. So there's that weird thing that I do understand what Chris is saying. Like, I uh, definitely you know, get a lot of that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, I want to. I want to find this out. Like, a, 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 and then when you have a specific question, and I do this too. When I have a very specific question, or I'm super stuck, or I can't find the video that's like, how do I hook up, you know, uh, MIDI the right way, or whatever I'm trying to learn, and I'm really actually truly stuck. That's when I bring um, a a fully researched question to a friend of mine that might know the answer. And I go, yo, I'm like super stuck. They then hopefully can like guide me through something more difficult than like, you know, the basics. So I, I see both sides. Uh, and oh, it's funny, uh, it's funny you said language too, Chad, because you mentioned something that I do all the time, which is I'll, before I even start to learn something or download it, I did this recently with Ableton Live, which is a beat making uh, recording software for music making and I knew I wanted to play with it I knew I wanted to try it and I didn't I didn't quite want to like open it up and start playing yet I almost I wanted to get familiar with the language first and so I just started listening I, I wasn't even watching the tutorials I would literally like put them on YouTube close down YouTube 
And if you have YouTube Red or whatever, there's probably other ways to do this. Your phone will just keep the audio playing. You walk around the town. So instead of podcasts, I would just listen to audio of people talking about it. I and do that too. <laughs> it's almost like um, it's almost like when you when you want to learn a new language, this is what they tell you to do. The fastest way to do it is to go to that area of the world where they speak it and just listen to them. And the second best thing to do is is just put it on your Put it on your uh, podcast or put it on your phone. I mean, put it in your headphones and just listen. You don't even have to know what they're saying, but you eventually will start to get clues on how the language is put together and how the structure is. And you start to pick out words. And as you learn, you now have this overall frame of reference. So when I eventually did download Ableton and I opened it, I had this language that I could pull from and I could go, okay, I, I, now I see where that is and I'm fitting it into the, to the, to the software world instead of opening this landscape. Now I've also done the opposite, like what Chris does, which is open a piece of software and just go, I'm just going to click every button until I break it. And, and then I'm going to go watch or learn or read the manual. Cause now I know uh, where all the buttons are. So there, there's a way for both. I, I, and man, I just, uh, I hate to be the person that says, yeah, they both work, but, uh, I don't. I don't know why. Yeah, I no, it's not, every, everybody has their own way. I mean, there's no like no right or wrong way to do it. I think it's just about finding what works and just kind of building off of that. I will say that if you're learning new software, one thing that that could help you is to try to re like. When I was learning Cinema coming from 3ds Max, like what I did is I took the last five jobs I had done in 3ds Max and said, okay, what were the what were the main components of those jobs? I'm going to try to rebuild them after I had like gone through all of the your guys' tutorials and I felt like I had a pretty good grasp of what was happening. I said, okay, I'm going to try to recreate the main components of the last five jobs I did and see how it goes. And it really helped me uh, learn the program in a way that I think tutorials and even just farting around couldn't do because I was forced to solve a problem that I that I already knew the answer to and it was like you know the end result you need to get to and you knew you know how you you know how you put this puzzle together over there but I'm gonna give you the exact same picture on the puzzle but all the pieces are gonna be cut differently so go do that and then you start to learn oh okay i understand so the modifier stack in 3ds max is sort of like the tag workflow in cinema and to make objects editable it's this you know and you start to like connect the the tissue together and that was really really hard like i got to say though that like coming from 3ds max and the modifier stack it was so weird like this i still to this day don't fully understand the differences between high like where your object sits in the object uh manager and the tags and and i still don't fully understand how it how it the hierarchy there and how it organizes it it's very weird to me and I'm I'm still learning, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> That's the best thing. Well, and and I'm so glad you said that because it's something that I always forget. Speaking of things that I preach a lot that I sometimes don't follow, is when I open this music software, I immediately wanted to like make a beat and put a little guitar riff over it and make a piano thing. And I was trying to get all creative with like what chords I was using and you know, like figuring out just the right little sound. And I stopped and I was like, hold up. Like, I, I can't learn this piece of software and write a song at the same time. I need to just like make a song I know that somebody else wrote or some a song that I wrote years ago and recreate it in this world. And as soon as I did that, I learned the, the software, which was the important part at the time, way faster because I knew the end goal. And I, I wasn't trying to solve like two things at once. It's like, it's like trying to you know, dig two tunnels at the same time and meet in the middle when you're trying to be creative and learn software. And it's something I've uh, talked about a lot about, you know, just just literally copying, like finding something that's you've already done, either that you've done in the past or that your your heroes have done on their screen, and looking at it and not stopping until it looks like theirs or it looks like your old work. And only then do you know the tool 
then you could take your tool skills and go make something creative with it. And I totally broke my own rule with that. And as soon as I said, okay, I'm just gonna like recreate this Wagon Christ song that I've always liked. And I was like, all right, I need to program the drums in that way. I need to figure out how to make things shuffle just the right way and put the bass in just the right way and figure out the compression and like, okay, now mine sounds kind of like that song. Mm-hmm. Okay, now now I'm on to something. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good way to do it. Oh man, well, geez, I mean, I just where I don't know what happened in this podcast episode. I'm I'm going down tunnels. I think, I think um, this is important in in a lot of ways. And and if you're listening, and you're like, what we guys talk about Cinema Forty, um, learning how to learn, I think is one of the big like best skills that you can acquire. No matter where you are, if you're just starting off in your career, if you're down the road, you're trying to learn something about an, a, an advanced piece of software, or maybe if, even if it's a, just how to, I don't know, become a public speaker. And you're like, I, now part of my job is pitching the clients and talking in front of crowds, and I need to learn how to become a better public speaker. Let's just say that's a popular thing that is important. How do you go about that? Like, how do you go about this in this world of like becoming better at something? And that pursuit for me is one of the most interesting things to talk about. And secondarily, it's always interesting to know how other people learned what they are good at. Software, it doesn't matter. Like if they're a good athlete, a good um, like mother, <laughs> if they're a good uh, person, if they're a good juggler, like whatever they are good at, there is a story of how they w- went through that path. And f- at, for me, at least, that's one of the most interesting stories and things that I love asking people, because um, it's always it, it is always different. And once you find your patterns, I think it's really interesting to recognize that those are patterns, so that next time you could boom learn it even faster. I would be super curious for anybody listening, like to put in some comments about the style of learning that works for you, especially if it's something that's dramatically different than the ones we've talked about. It's always curious to see like the patterns people people can do and like repetition or writing down notes and different memorization techniques. There's so many different cool ways of learning and depending on the situation, you might use one or use another, but especially different ones. I'd be super curious about hearing writing stuff down. That used to be, that used to be the way I would do it. I remember when I was, I think I was just learning 3d. I would like literally have a pad of paper and just write stuff down as I was messing around that I wanted to go back and look up what it actually was doing that night. So I would like come across a term that I had never knew what it was at, what it actually meant. So instead of just saying, Oh, this term and like do the thing I wanted to go back in and like, I wanted to remember what that term was so that I could actually tell what it was doing and writing it down was always such a great help. I recently, Did you reference it? I'm sorry, Chris, did you reference the writing down or just the act of writing it down? Well, no. Well, I would try to go back. I would, I would, it was like I was taking notes. So like I would come across a term, um, I'll just say like UV or something like when I was very new to 3d and I heard kept, you know, I would see it a lot of places. So I'd write it down. I'd be like, remind my, it was almost like a reminder note, remind myself to that night go and try to research what the hell this meant like what is it so that i understand what it's doing and just things like that or i would write down this is kind of crazy but what i would do later in my job when i was planning out a a job like let's say a commercial or something i would write down everything that i thought we would need in, in terms of people plugins staffing and then, then I would even go as far as like, I would write down all my render passes. Like I would write down every pass that I thought I would need in the comp. And then I would name it. And I would, sometimes I would even go really crazy and do like total like flow charts of saying like, all right, first thing we're going to do is we're going to simulate this particle effect. Then that sim is going to go to this person and that person's going to hand it over to this. Then it's going to go to comp comp, and then it's going to go out to edit. It's going to name it here. And I would just like map it all out. But I think that the question Nick is asking was, is it the act of writing it down that is useful? Like it's got now your brain and now it's kind of in there. Or do you actually go back and start referring to those notes as a useful tool unto themselves? I think 
it's not one or the other. Sometimes I would use them as notes and like go back in and like, oh yeah, I got to I got to remember to look this term up. But then sometimes yes, it was like more about me mentally preparing a workflow and then seeing it on paper was allowing me to think about it in a in a in a different way where I could see a flaw in that idea or the flaw in the staffing or the workflow that I couldn't think of just by like picturing it in my head. I had to physically write it down to say, okay, well that's stupid. I don't need to do this right here. That's, that's redundant. Um, but yeah, it was a mixture I'd say, but I really like, I, I still write notes down. I've got like my pad of paper here that I'm constantly trying to, remember important things or jump back to something and as much as they've made it easy to like take notes on your computer using all sorts of different apps i still just like writing stuff down not only not only do you like writing stuff down there is there are studies there's evidence that physically writing it down on paper is a lot better for your memory than writing it down on the computer like the act of typing out on a computer is not as good as just writing it with a pen on paper yeah, I've always liked uh, Field Notes, um, their tagline. Um, I had to go to their site to make sure I oh, nailed I it. it yeah. But it's, uh, I'm not writing it down to remember it later. I'm writing it down to remember it now. I've always liked that because I'm the same way with notes. I'll fill up books and books and books of notes from books I'm reading, from podcasts I'm listening to, from things I'm learning. And then it's so rare that I go back and read through it. And, and, and in fact, even just doodling while I'm thinking and explaining something. Chris knows this more than anybody. We'd, we'd go out to lunch <laughs> and I'd fill up a field notes book with just scribbles and arrows and connecting dots. And it wasn't even for illustration for anyone else. It was just to like help my brain connect the dots before it came out of my mouth. Yeah, and, it's even connect, yeah, a deeper level of engagement. You're even, you're engaging like a motor skill simultaneously to make a memory. So you've made this like double connection yeah, and I, I I walk a lot when I when I talk. I uh, yeah, I, like if I'm on a phone call, I'm up walking around the neighborhood, and I feel like there's this engagement better when you're when you're on a call and you're talking and you're thinking. So if I'm sitting, maybe I just need some somewhere to move. But but these these are interesting. Like um, grab grab one of your notebooks right now and just flip to a page of nonsense. Oh, oh. that'd be great. Oh man, <laughs> I, can, I I, don't, I found I don't have one any of Mine have like, uh, uh, here we go. You have to flip to a random page. You can't curate it. Uh, here's, well, here's I some have. Of my oh, yeah, there you go. Perfect illustration. I have stuff in here that that's kind of sensitive, so I can't. Actually, you know, I can't show. Uh, I got a lot of product notes for upcoming GSG products. That's <laughs> most of mine are are like code. <laughs> so detail, I can't. So. I can't share that. But. Well, listen. Thanks for indulging me, guys. I didn't mean to. Uh, I think I hijacked the entire episode there, but I think there's. Um, some some it's an interest of mine i'm sure and really every time i talk to you know a, a, like a little kid that is interested in something they have the same questions as like a 50 year old learning a, a new difficult skill and it's really how how things engage with you like everyone's uh, this is why it's hard everyone's unique Everyone's raised different ways. Everyone relates differently. Like maybe they're more physical. They need to touch stuff. Maybe they need to write stuff. Maybe they need to, like, I'm a doer. Like I, if I watch somebody juggle, I can't just, I got to do it. I got to see how hard it is before I like really get interested in it. I got to like touch it and play the guitar and make a mess. Then go back and learn. Like learning how to learn and learning how you learn I think is one of the, like the greatest pursuits in 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 the world. Uh, it's it's one of the things that if you can nail down how to like how to stay physically healthy for your body type or whatever like whatever you need and how to stay mentally engaged with things over a long period of time. I think those are two of the best skills you can do for your for your entire life and so every time there's this conversation i meet somebody new like i did this weekend that's my go-to i'm like how did you get into that how did you learn it what was the hook and how did you take that hook and thread it through and take it all the way to a career getting paid to do this i think that line that little line from the hook 
to getting paid is such an interesting, weird little story to tell. And everybody's got that story. Yeah. Everybody's got that story. I, I, and it's so interesting to me. So thanks for indulging me. Um, sp uh, chat, speaking of uh, Grayscale Gorilla, <laughs> new Grayscale Gorilla things, I think we uh, meant to talk about this earlier, but should we um, talk about what's coming up here at Grayscale Gorilla? Yeah, I think it's finally time to uh, enlighten everyone about this fantastic product that we have coming up. You want to set it up? Do I set it up? I think yeah, I think I could. I haven't like I haven't talked enough this episode. I'm ready. <laughs> I can set it up. It's fine. Maybe it's the coffee. I, I'm ready. Um, you're on a roll, man. I'm not going to get in your way. Drum roll. So, speaking of learning new things, there are there's software that come out that um like Cinema 4D. I think Cinema is one of those pieces of software that comes out and just totally blows everyone's mind on how how easy it is to use but also yet how powerful it is when you really want to dig into it. That's, I know what is interested me in After Effects. It's what interested me in Cinema 4D. And when X Particles came out, it's what interested me in X Particles. It was super simple to, it was like MoGraph, but for millions of particles instead of thousands. And I could go in and I could click on stuff and instantly see results and I could, you know, layer up their filters. Um, but as soon as I started jumping into the more complex parts of X particles where it gets really powerful, when you start to learn about questions and answers and, and using different groups and all that stuff, for me at least, that's when it got a little bit tougher. That's when I started to go like, okay, th this is the part of the program that I want to dig in more. I know it's powerful. I know there are some really powerful things I could do with this, but I don't, I don't have, it's not the, the natural like progression through. If only I could sit next to somebody and learn what the heck uh, I'm, I'm doing. If, I, if only I could just watch somebody go through the process of building fully formed effects inside of X particles, I know that I could eventually get it. So that not only happened to me, it's also happening a lot to uh, a lot of our customers that are using X particles. They're making beautiful stuff. And then as soon as there's that barrier, and that wall, I've always wanted to try to break that next part of the wall down. And that's why, did I set it up okay, Chad? <laughs> You're doing great, man. This is looking, <laughs> I'm getting excited. Yeah, yeah, it's working, right? And that's why uh, very soon, I, I, do, we, do we dare put a date on this? It's very, very soon. Very soon, I think, is a fine date. That's 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 pretty good. good we date. we are launching. I, I'm with, I got the momentum now. I'm excited. We are launching the gorilla guide to x particles and this is the pro yeah I'm, I'm going through all of our training this is the most robust training that we've ever put out um on grayscale gorilla period definitely it is amazing and our boy uh john bosley uh helped us with this and and more than helped us he stepped up and uh, if you he don't know John, <laughs> he did it. He, he, he's a great artist. He does amazing work. And, uh, so we asked him to help us build like the ultimate guide to X particles, something that you can go reference when you're stuck, just like we talked about today, you know, you're stuck in like how to, how to exactly do groups work, how exactly do, um, questions and answers and, and things work. Uh, you could dive in and go to that specific video, watch it from somebody that does this for a living and come back out and start to play with it. Or maybe you're like me and you learn more project based and you, you just want to go like, all right, what's the final thing we're going to build. Okay. That's exciting. Let, how do you, how do you do that? We also have, what is it like six, seven projects? Yeah. Seven, I, seven projects that John goes through and they're the, the training was kind of designed uh, around all the problems that you mentioned. And specifically for me, I was excited about it because uh, I, I always really liked X particles and thought it was really powerful and cool. But I always struggled with the fact that a lot of training and other things out there for X particles was always so um, abstract. And a lot of the things that I know I need to do in my work is not quite always abstract. Sometimes I need to make a very physical effect like rain, snow, things like that. And, and that was where I was like, I wanted this training to cover 
real world project scenarios that you're going to encounter when you use X particles? Because let's face it, we're not always able to make just like fun, abstract strangeness, which is covered in the training, by the way. But I want to be able to have that foundation of things that actually happen, things that actually you're assigned to do in your job. So that's why I was really stoked to see that we have like seven, I think, projects um, that are taken directly from things that you might get assigned to do in your job using X particles. But then on top of that, I mean, John just went nuts and like created this appendix of videos that's just insane with so much content that it really is, in my opinion, the ultimate X particles training I've seen. And I'm not just saying that because I've been working on it for a while with John, but it it's fantastic. Well, as, you know, as the videos came in and as Chad started showing me and John started showing me exactly what was included, I mean, we had to, we had to come up with a, an entirely new name to describe this thing. This wasn't just some training, you know. Um, this was an, a, a, a new way, at least for me, once I saw it, was a new way to look at how you can teach and how you can learn something. So what's really cool about it is like I said, it has this robust appendix, like how much, like 30 videos just in that side of things and, yeah. and little short videos that describe exactly what each of these elements do. And I know that sometimes I learn that way. Sometimes I just need to go like this button does this, this, uh, you know, emitter has these options. This is how, um, groups work, blah, you know, boom, 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 boom. And like I said, sometimes I, I just I need to I need to see the future and see the project that we're building to to have that hook to kind of pull me into the to, into the project. And what's cool about this is it goes has both sides. It's like a choose your own adventure. You want to start and learn all the buttons. Go ahead. You want to start with a project and and we start kind of simple and it gets more complicated. Go that way too. And so it it, it got me thinking like this this just isn't you know some training you watch. Um, this is something that you can visit early on to learn the basics but then have on your uh like in your pocket when you need it to go learn some more advanced stuff when that client asks you for you know something crazy you're like i know it's possible i don't quite know how to do it but <laughs> let I, me go check but let me <laughs> you, you tell your client yeah i could do that and then you fire up the training and you're like all right uh tell me again how uh how i can control this right um so that yeah so we we have this it, it's a gorilla guide you know it's an entirely new way that we're looking at training very robust um and and we're excited to to launch it we're excited to get it out there and uh get your eyes on it we'll have details and pricing and all that stuff really soon but i wanted to start to tell you guys about it because you know frankly because we know that some of you are freelancers, you know, something comes out and you could just get it when you need it. But we know a lot of you that listen are working at studios that are dangling credit cards above your head. And we budgets. also, and budgets and all that stuff. Um, so we know too um, that you kind of have to like get stuff ready and talk about it or whatever. So we're going to try to do less of springing um, products on anybody and trying to do a little bit more of getting excited describing what's coming so that um some of you working in uh companies that have budgets can like get this stuff ready so we're super super excited to get this thing out and uh it should be very soon that's a very very good date chad thank you <laughs> <laughs> we're we're still a small team you know here trying to trying to get stuff out and make sure and sometimes we mess up launch dates but we're, we're getting better and we're gonna have we're gonna be talking with John uh, very soon. Another another very soon. Um, we're gonna be talking with John, and and you guys will be able to hear him. And um, he's got a fantastic voice, so um, he's he's great to listen to in long durations. He's got that English accent going, which us Americans are suckers for. It's yeah. so, it's so it sounds automatically so sounds so smart. I know it's so it's ridiculous. Like cheating. I tried to, like I was doing a call with him, like going over some of the uh, training stuff, and I needed him. I forget. I needed him to re-record something, and I'm like, or I could just do it in your accent, 
and I tried to do my best like English accent, which was horrible, man. Like every English accent I do just comes out like really that Hockney kind of like style. Comes out Australian. And he was laughing his ass off at, at <laughs> me trying to do it. Then he would tell me if I did something sort of right, like, oh, that wasn't bad. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I got to work on that. I try to work on my accent. But anyway. That's the next training from John. We're going to get how to, how to fake the, the, uh, the awesome <laughs> English fake accent. British. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny that's cool uh, well yeah um so it thanks for listening thanks for checking that out and um we're gonna have this stuff out and available and uh, a whole page about what's included and there's scene files and there's a ton of stuff we're just we're really excited to get this out and we're it's it's a it's a new way that we're approaching training um it's it's one of the things that we get asked about the most right uh hey uh, all these intro videos are awesome that you guys do. You bring us into it. Man, this actually the topic worked really well today. That we have a lot that that kind of hooks people and go like, yes, this is X particles. This is awesome. I want more. And what's what's tough is to do long form training through YouTube. You know, it just doesn't work. Um, you to to really dive deep into something, you need to you need to have it and you need to um, ask somebody like professional that does this for a living all day to help you build it. Right. And so that's why we asked John, he's one of the best out there that works in X particles. And, uh, we just can't wait till you guys see everything in, involved. So we are pumped or pumped to get it ready, ready for you. So let us know. Um, you know, once, once you see it, we'll have obviously a place to do a Q and a, and we're going to have John either on the podcast or maybe even on our live show, which I should tell everybody. Um, uh, if you haven't been listening to recent podcasts, uh, we have a new live page at grayscalegorilla.com slash live. And, uh, there you're going to find a schedule and we're doing many more live shows over on our new Twitch channel. And, um, uh, I think John, will be a, either a guest on the live show or on the podcast here pretty soon. So hope to introduce you guys if you don't know about John. But um, yeah, we kind of moved the news to the end. What do you guys think? What do you guys think about this format where um, we just dive right in? A little, uh, little too crazy. Whoa, Nick, slow down. To, like drink last coffee. I wasn't. I wasn't ready. This is like whiplash. I just, <laughs> you know, it's fast. If if Chris is saying it's fast. <laughs> well, we got our first piece of comment. We got we got our first comment already before the episode ends. Too fast. Well, let us know. You know, this is um, this this podcast kind of started off as us talking after our uh, our weekly meetings and talking about what's what's happening at Grayscale Gorilla, what's what's happening in our industry, and um. And also some of the things like we talked about today, uh, how to learning how to learn, and things like we talked about um, in other episodes, like how to you know uh, get good feedback uh, and take feedback from clients and stuff like that. So we hope it's valuable to you. It's why we continue to do it. Our goal is to help the motion designer at all parts of their career, and um, uh, and we have fun doing it. So I hope you have fun listening to it. Um, if there's nothing else. Um, we could wrap this one up if there are show notes, which I don't know if there's too many show notes for this one, but, uh, we always put up show notes on all of our episodes over on our blog, or, uh, you can also subscribe on iTunes. If you're one of these, uh, people that walk around and listen to stuff on your headphones, like we talked about earlier in the podcast, man, podcasts are probably the thing I listen to most when I'm walking around town, uh, and, uh, doing dishes and all the other kind of things. Uh, so make sure you subscribe over there. I'd love to, uh, uh, I'd love to be in your ears. You know what I mean? Is that a thing you say? Is that a thing what people say? Uh, yeah. Let's just stop. Let's just cut him off now. Let's just uh, wrap this up. Yeah. Guys, who needs coffee? 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 All right, coffee. coffee. Can we play the playoff music for Nick? Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> the Emmys playoff music. That's actually a really funny idea. <laughs> Oh, what? All right. Uh, Take us out. Take us out. Oh, man. Me again. All right. Thanks again. Uh, if, man, if you made it this far, you're a true fan. Uh, then I truly <laughs> love you. I will see you in another uh, episode. Thanks again, guys, for chatting and uh, let me take over this one. That was fun. I'll see you in another Grace Go Girl podcast really soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.